Alex Zanardi is one of the fastest men on four wheels. In 2001, he was involved in one of motor racing's most horrific accidents. He lost both his legs. Today, Zanardi is back behind the wheel of a racing car. My name is Peter White. I'm blind and the BBC's disability correspondent. I first met Alex Zanardi just a year after his accident. I've come back to Italy to discover how he has defied the odds and rebuilt his life. Alex Zanardi is preparing for a new season of the European Touring Car Championships. I've come to the famous Imola Raceway during his pre-season testing of his specially prepared racing BMW 320i. He's gone through these routines hundreds of times before. Making final adjustments, last minute checks, controlling the nerves before roaring out of the pit lane to shave another thousandth of a second from the lap time. I'm intrigued to find out why he's back in a racing car after being almost killed while competing at the Lausitz ring in Germany in September 2001. Alex Zanardi, um, over two years ago you came within an ace of death. Why are you racing again? People ask me this question because they look at me and they see me more vulnerable than somebody else. I am not more vulnerable. My mother thinks I am not more vulnerable than Michael Schumacher. Me and Daniela, Alex's wife, thought he wouldn't race again. The only thing that had changed in our life was that Alex had finished racing. Instead, no, he didn't. Zanardi's accident happened the first weekend after 9-11. The drivers were depressed. It rained. It had all the hallmarks of a bad day. But Zanardi felt good. His car was fastest in practice. I'm just interested what you remember about, about the day, but before it happened, the early part of the day. I could see the cars in front of me at the beginning of the race, me going by, my teammate, and going by Max, Max Pappis, which is a, one of my buddies, and it was, it was really good. The crash had a lasting impact on his friends in motorsport. He had been leading the race, had to make a pit stop with 13 laps to go. Uh, he still had a chance to get out on the track, uh, reads, uh, take the lead, and win the event. I, put, I turned my head a little bit, and I saw Alex taking off from the pit and I was passing him and say, wow, I made it. I remembered me going out from the pit lane, losing control of the car, trying to recover control and uh, spinning around in the grass. And, uh, and so now I remember until, uh, until the big noise. Alex Tagliani, who ran into Alex, uh, was running at approximately 194 miles an hour. Um, he split Alex's car in two. Uh, not only that, he basically exploded Alex's car. When uh, Tagliani hit me and, uh, and the classic noise of the car falling apart, and, uh, and then I don't go any, any longer than that. The medical team was immediately on the scene. They had three minutes to save Alex Zanardi's life. Dr. Trammell came across the radio. He said, uh, Steve, this is bad. This is, uh, this is really bad. And I said, well, how bad is it? And he said, uh, his legs are gone. And I said, what do you mean they're gone? And he said, they're gone. 
And uh, I said, well, is there anything that, that you can salvage, anything that could be reattached? He said, no, you don't understand. He said, they are gone. When I went to turn one, I kind of saw it was a big mess. And uh, you kind of tend to block the things out of your brain when you're racing because, first of all, because you don't see it. And second, because uh, it's something that uh, you never, even if you see, you never look at it. You never want to, you know, your brain doesn't accept that. Just after the accident, I'm moving around, I'm trying to open my visor. So somehow I must have been awake. Um, I must have looked down and say, ooh, <laughs> it's going to be hard to fix this one. Uh, When Alex arrived at the helicopter, he uh, virtually uh, quit breathing. He began having trouble with his, uh, with his heart rhythm. In fact, uh, he was dying. When Zanardi was airlifted to hospital in Berlin, he had just one liter of blood left in his body. For the next five days, he remained in a coma. He underwent 15 operations to clean up his legs. When he regained consciousness, his wife Daniela was at his bedside. Uh, my wife uh, woke me up and uh, she told me what happened. I understood clearly what she said and honestly that uh, the fact that I lost my legs was the last of my problems at the time. She told you very straight though, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's not much to go around, you know, that, that's it, uh, that, that is what happened. I knew I could trust my wife, I knew that she wouldn't try to make it any, any sweeter than it was in reality. She told me, hey Claudio, meaning Claudio Costa, he's been here and uh, he's gone to the center where uh, they treat all the patients for this uh, sort of uh, problems, for this amputation and he's measured your legs, uh, what's, uh, what's left of your limbs, and uh, he thinks you're going to be walking again and doing a lot of things as you were doing before. I got in touch with a center with a good reputation for prosthetic construction and rehabilitation, where people had suffered the same injuries and severity and accident. It's not far from the town where Alex Zanardi was born, Castel Maggiore. Zanardi has made a remarkable recovery. Doctors told him it would take 18 months to walk again. He did it in three. His determination has made him even more of a local hero. I couldn't stay still. I had to walk, I had to do something. And the first day, uh, the pain was uh, incredible. And uh, it took uh, all the determination I could find to continue uh, the exercise and to continue to try to walk. He was soon standing up, his first steps. Seeing the people at the center, having lots of difficulties. But instead, with his desire, he was able to do lots of things. For him, it was like a challenge. It was a victory, like winning a race. <laughs> Wherever he goes, fans, teammates, patients, doctors and nurses stop him for his autograph. But Zanardi's situation is not unique. At a specialist prosthetic clinic here in Bologna, ironically Zanardi's hometown, I've come to meet the professionals he's worked with to put his life back together again. Can I just ask you, you you've worked with, uh, with Alex. Could you, could you say something about his approach uh, and his attitude? I've worked with Alex since I met him. I worked on a psychological level because it is important to know the reaction of the patient and the treatment, especially psychologically. And I learnt that Alex is a very curious person, interested in every detail with the prosthetics. So uh, the extent to which he has 
regained movement and confidence. How unusual is that with that level of injury? His level of amputation is very important. Firstly, because he had both legs amputated. And secondly, because his stumps were short. In spite of that, Alex wanted to walk again. With his strength and determination, and the help of the clinic, we achieved something special. But like Alex, everybody can achieve that. Can I ask you both about how Alex reacted to, to this uh, gym here and the setup here? Because it's very open, a lot of people should, all here doing their, doing their own thing. I wondered how Alex um, reacted to that. Alessandro. Alex is in the media all the time. They could see him as one of them. And they were doing the same thing as him. No more, no less. I remember the first time uh, we came out here and I was walking in the grass like this. It was such a difficult exercise. I mean, uh, I had one person each side ready to, to get me. And you don't know how many times I fell just taking ridiculous small te steps as high as five centimeters, you know. And to go around a small step like that, it would be, it would be really, really difficult. To walk on a rough surface was <clears throat> almost impossible for me. So <clears throat> it was bloody hard, let me say. <laughs> Alessandro is optimistic like me. We always think that things will get sorted out and that life goes on. That's the way we think. He's got my calmness in life. Maybe he's even better than me. From his father, he gets his sense of humor. He was very humorous. Alex Zanardi was born in Bologna in 1966, just half an hour's drive from the famous Imola racetrack. Motor racing is in the blood of the Italians, but it's an expensive obsession, and Alex came from a relatively poor background. He got into motor racing almost by chance. When he was a teenager, his sister was killed in a car crash. Alex's protective parents tried to keep him off the road by making a deal. His father bought him a go-kart where his energies could be more safely channeled. Can you just tell me how this passion for racing started? It started back in uh, 1980 when my father bought me a go-kart and uh, I got addicted immediately. And uh, as funny as it could sound at the time, uh, the first lap I took with my go-kart around the local circuit, I said, this is what I'm going to do, I want to do in my life. He was a natural-born driver. Racing became his life. He married his team manager, Daniela, and quickly climbed the motor racing ladder, winning kart championships, Formula 3000, and then his big break into Formula One at Lotus, where he teamed up with Johnny Herbert. We met, I think, in 93, 94, when we were both at Lotus. Um, and he joined the team. I knew a little bit about him when he was doing Formula 3000. Um, and then um, we just got on like a house on fire, basically. You know, we had a, we had a good laugh. Uh, we were both very focused on what we were trying to do on the track, which was beat each other at the end of the day. You always want to beat your teammate. But it just always seemed to be something that we had a good, a good rapport. Zanardi and Herbert became firm friends but things went sour for him at Team Lotus. He wasn't getting paid and Lotus was in financial trouble and then they actually stopped him racing and got some other drivers in who were paying and sort of he lost, a, he lost out and then he, that was really the last of his first part of Formula One, which is then he went off to the States in 1995, uh, like so. There's a saying in motor racing which means uh, uh, speed costs money, how fast you want to go, you know, and uh, 
we didn't have much money available to go fast. Alex then headed for the States, where he became an immediate hit. His daredevil stunts and ready wit endeared him to the more show business style of America. In 97 and 98, he became only the second driver to win back-to-back -back kart championships, America's version of Formula One. I suppose his main highlights has got to be his, his two kart championships, because that's sort of the one of the biggest series in, in, in motorsport. After his kart successes, he returned to Formula One with the Williams team. Again, though, things didn't work out. With Williams, it was a completely different story. It's not, it was not about money, but it was probably more a story of uh, lack of determination from both sides to make uh, the relationship work. In 2001, Zanardi made the fateful decision to go back to the States and to his first love, the kart championships. After a poor start to the season, the teams moved to the Lausitz ring in Germany. With 13 laps to go, Zanardi was leading the field. When exiting the pit lane, he lost control of the car and his life was changed forever. But just 18 months after the crash, he was back in a racing car specially prepared with hand controls. He returned to the racetrack that had almost cost him his life. He symbolically completed the final 13 laps in front of an ecstatic German crowd. I kind of thought he was just going to cruise around, do 13 laps, wave to the crowd, and, and that would be it. He went fast. In fact, he went fast enough that he could have qualified sixth. He ran the car as fast as that car would go. He now felt ready to go back to competitive racing. In 2003, he signed up with BMW's touring car team using a specially modified car. Tell me about the car and how it's been adapted for you. It's a normal brake pedal on which we just mounted a sort of a second shoe uh, where I put my foot so my foot can't slide off and held my foot in position and just with the movement of my hip uh, using the, the knee as a joint I, I operate the brakes. Throttle is just a sort of a ring under the steering wheel that I pull with my fingers. The only thing we have put on is a, a little lever um, like a sort of a little butterfly on the top of the gear lever uh, which operates the clutch and that's about it. How different is it driving the way you're driving now? Since after my accident I have realized you know when you're forced to do something mm. not the way you always did it previously in your life because you have no option you adapt a mental flexibility that wasn't yours before it, it's interesting you say that because when people talk to me as a blind person about compensations and I, I used to scoff a bit because they'd say, oh, well, you must have better hearing. I'd say, no, I just listen properly. But, uh, I mean, I gather they've now done some research which suggests that uh, the bit of the brain that you use for uh, seeing, you also use for hearing and the, the feeling is that maybe there's some spare capacity. I mean, is, is there a parallel there with, with you? Maybe you, you're using your brain in a I don't know, a different way? <laughs> well, there must be spare because my brain was so small before. <laughs> I don't think he could dedicate some to, some to do something else. I don't know. But um, you, I mean, you obviously think, besides you're, thinking, kidding. You think you're, you're thinking harder. No, yeah, besides kidding, I, I think, yeah, definitely, there is uh, spare capabilities or maybe... Maybe, you know, we are able to transform or to readapt a part of our brain to develop new talents. Yeah, that's for sure. Behind the Imola race circuit at a mobile clinic, Alex collects a new pair of lightweight prosthetic legs he has helped design. And not just for walking. Every gram of weight possible has been saved to make them suitable for racing as well. What you're going to see, I hope it will not impress you because I'm going to take everything off. And uh, as long as it's fine for you, I don't have a particular problem, you know? So. Tristan, 
buona. Ci siamo le scarpe. Ce le do subito. Sono con i jeans, Perry. Ah, l'hai dotato il capolavoro. Dio buono che figata. <ride> Bella cazzo. Senti eh? qua. Bella, leggera. Dio buono, Ferri. Se va anche bene. Siamo dei signori. No, per i venti simpli. Unusually for recent amputees, Zanardi has only needed one pair of prosthetic legs in over two years. Though he may laugh it off, changing legs is a big deal. What I'm doing today is that uh, I got a couple of legs which fits fine, but uh, they're very old. Yeah, so they're out of my legs, basically. <laughs> so what we did... Uh, Um, we just copy those ones which fit fine for me and they reproduce uh, two new ones uh, with exactly the same mechanisms. There's a flexible foot, there's many different kinds of, uh, of foot, of feet, sorry. Uh, there's a tube which connects uh, the foot to the knee joint. Uh, the knee joint is uh, basically made in a way with a double joint So when it's completely extended uh, and it's straight and you lean on the ill, uh, this sort of second mechanism kind of lock the system, so that gives you stability. But then as you step forward and you release the mechanism from your own weight, then the mechanism frees up and opens and moves. Then there's a small spring which puts the foot back in position mm. and that helps you to walk mm. and in particular in this one we've put this rotator mechanism which helps me a lot uh, to get myself dressed to put clothes on we uh, we rely a lot on technology you and i don't we <laughs> uh <laughs> yes somehow you know i mean uh, not only us in reality because i mean even If she wants to catch uh, this particular moment and give it back to the people which are going to be watching on television, mm -hmm. you know, she needs to utilize some sort of technology. Yep. Um, we probably just need a little more than normal people, but uh, at the end of the day, we all use technology, you know. And uh, the important thing is to try to be the one that operates the technology. That's what it matters. Being in control of it. Yeah. 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 I'm impressed at the practical approach Alex takes to his disability. Wherever he goes, he carries with him a four millimeter screwdriver. He had a very, very good understanding mechanically of how car suspension, gearboxes and everything worked. And the lovely thing about him now is he's got a fantastic, lovely understanding mechanically of how his legs work. And he's, he's, the, he's the perfect guy for that because he's, he's redesigned them himself. And that's just something that he's Alex. The parallels Zanardi sees between his car and his mechanics, his legs and his doctors, are striking. To him, his medical situation is just another technological problem to be solved. think is that when I stand up I feel pressure on the feet you know mm -hmm. I feel my feet like they're mine I tap the ground and I feel I feel right now I'm tapping with the with the heel not with the with the point of the foot if I do this I can feel I can feel which with with which part of the foot I'm tapping the ground if you touch my foot with a pencil I can feel exactly where you're tapping And yet there are so that, that is kind of incredible, you know, yeah. because at the beginning <laughs> it wasn't anything like it, you know. But now that's the way it is, so that's, weird, that's good. Though. That helps me a lot too, because, you know, it's like when I break the, when I push the brake pedal of my race car, I feel I can modulate the pressure pretty accurately, and that, that is helping me a lot. All I can say is probably become more determined than what he was before, because I think he's got something else that he's he's got to 
got to work on. And I think the, the, the lucky thing is because he's because he's got his son, and that is something that he's he wants that to work. Um, and the same with Daniela. I think he wants to give you know his whole family a normal way of life. Being along huh? now, my my first priority is certainly. Uh, the one to try to be a good father for my son, to be a good husband for my wife, a good friend for my friends, and um, and also to uh, go back to racing because this is my passion and this is what I always did in my my own life. I could not do it at the same level I, I was doing it before. He appreciates simple things more than he did before. Everyday things like his family, his son. Alex Zanardi knows how lucky he is to be alive, and he's making the most of it with his family. But just being alive isn't enough for Alex. I think he's a man who will always need another challenge. And for the moment, it's still his beloved racing. with a situation that he's got with his legs, but also that it's the European touring car thing would be a wonderful thing for him to, to be able to, to win that. And it would make a, I don't know, a fairy, a fairy tale ending to the, whole, to the whole story. But I'm sure he won't just stop a touring car. There'd be something else he'd be doing in the future anyway that he'd get involved with. When something like this happened to you, you're normally inclined to believe that you are the unluckiest man on, on earth. And in fact, you're not. You know, I'm lucky to be alive. After all, I could have lost much more or something like this. There is people in life that are much more unlucky than me. Nevertheless, they go on with their life and they find more than one reason to smile. I knew that Alex would have never quit. No matter if he had to, you know, raise his wheelchair or, uh, you know, race a Formula One car again. You know, it, is he would have not quit because he is a champion and he's a champion in his heart throughout his recovery Zanardi has always admitted to pain but never to doubt and with his characteristic optimism he will admit to no fears for the future either I've seen a patient here which is uh, 82 years old he's got a ample amputation very similar to mine and uh, he walks around, certainly not at the speed that I'm walking around, but I guarantee you he's walking around every, every day. And um, he walks around on his legs and he's, uh, he's in excellent shape. And uh, for me, this is an inspiration. You know, I say, hey, this is uh, what I could be maybe one day if I'm lucky. that never quite worked properly, but looked so cool. DeLorean, the story of the car and its creator, coming up. <laughs> 